from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, we have just barely made it past New Year's. And it's, you know, how many of you have already written a check or, or a dated something and still put 2016 on it? It takes a while to get shifted mentally into the new year. But as I said in the prayers, we look back at 2016 and we see God's faithfulness at every turn. And so we look forward to this year, 2017, with, with absolute confidence and absolute determination. We want something specific to happen. We want to grow. We want to grow personally. We want to grow as a congregation. We want to grow in our ability to, to minister and serve people within the walls of this church and those outside the walls of this church, regardless of who they are. But in order for us to grow and become everything that God desires for us to be, we have to understand what God's will is for us. What God's will is for each of us individually, as well as what is God's will for us collectively. And I want you to understand two aspects of God's will. There is a universal will of God, something that is, is particular to each and every one of us, we all share the same thing. God has a perfect will for all of us, but then God also has a will for us in particular, something that's unique to you. So there is one will of God that is universal for all of Christendom and a will of God for you in your particular circumstance of life. And in order to understand that, you have to first understand what is God's will for you. I'm using a theme starting today and for the rest of this month that's entitled Tempered, Refined by the, by the Purifying Fires. And by, Prophet Malachi talks about when Jesus comes, he's going to be like a refiner of gold or silver, one who removes the impurities and leaves what is pure and of value. And that is what God desires to do to us. And in our Methodist or Wesleyan way of talking, we have a very unique way and specific way of addressing this. But before we get to that, it starts with our understanding of God's grace. It starts with our understanding of what we call justification. And by that, what I mean is that moment, that instant that God's grace and the Holy Spirit impacted your life, something happened. The moment that Jesus Christ and the message of his truth of the gospel is preached in its purity and the spirit worked to create faith in your heart, in that instant, you were justified. What does that mean? It means that in that moment, everything that Jesus did became yours individually and personally. We call it justification by grace through faith. That's the moment that you and your heart of hearts first understood that yes, Jesus died for the whole world, but when he was hanging upon that cross suffering, he was suffering for me. When he was shedding his blood to pay for sin, he was shedding his blood to pay for my sin. And the death he died and the life he lives assures me of forgiveness and eternal life. The moment your heart believed that, you were justified. You were declared not guilty. You were adopted into the family of God. You became a child of God. And in that instant, God had a holy, perfect will for your life. What is the will of God for you, for me, and for all Christians around the world? What is His will? He wants us to become just like Jesus. That's His will. That's His desire. For us to become a reflection of who Jesus is in this world. In our Wesleyan tradition, as I said, we have a way we talk about that. It's called moving on toward perfection or Christian perfection. The hang-up comes in the use of the word perfection, which we in our English language have the idea it means being totally complete and perfect in every way. But that's not how Wesley understood it. He understood it 
as being complete. He learned that from studying the early church fathers, that we are to be complete in our faith. He never meant that we would be without sin. He never meant that we would not sin. What he understood is that we could become so mature in our faith that we could love God and love others just like Jesus did. And we could accomplish that in this life. That's our goal, to be like Jesus in every way. It is God's desire for us to, to do exactly what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. Do you realize that Jesus would not have given us a command if it was not within our ability to keep it? He gave that to us because that is the goal of what it means to live as a child of God. And it is something that we can accomplish. John, in the epistle lesson, said, He who says he abides in him ought to himself walk just as he walked. That is who we are to be. We call it Christian maturity. Growing in our understanding of who we are as a child of God. So how is God going to do this? How is God going to mold and shape you into the image of Christ in this world? It starts with God working in our hearts with the refining fire. With the purifying fire. Sifting out and removing that which is contrary to his will. And it's not that difficult for us to understand that. I, I typically fall to a, a simple pattern. We sin in thought, word, and deed. Simple triad way to think about it. And yet we do, don't we? We do sin in the way we think. Sometimes we live in our own little world. And because of that, we put more stock in what we think than in what God says. For instance, some of us, because of our past, because of mistakes we've made or circumstances, we live in our own little world and think how horrible we have been, how bad of a person we are, how unworthy we are. And we set aside what God says about us and what, God, what value God places on us, and in our minds we think we're worth nothing. And yet God says that we are more precious than silver and more costly than gold. Other times, in our minds, we do go the opposite direction. We need to take heed the words of Paul. No one should think more of himself than he ought. Because sometimes we look at those around us and think, boy, I'm a better person than that is. Look at how they're living their life. We compare our sins to the sins of others. I've never done anything that bad. And because of that, we fall into that realm of self-justification. I'm not such a bad person. You see, the way we think is the first step. Then it begins to come out in the way we speak. Do you find yourself talking about other people? Talking about their mistakes, their flaws, the way they dress, the way they look? Do you criticize a lot? Do do your words bring life or do they bring death? Do you gossip a lot? Do you, do you like to play the middle? Do you like to be the person that talks to this one and talks to that one and is in the middle and they get crossways and you're the innocent party yet you stirred it up? You see, our mouths are a great tool for the devil to use. With thoughts and with word, then come actions. And we're not talking about just the gross actions people do in their spare time. Uh, get more, more serious about it. Are you an honest person? Do you work diligently for your employer when the employer's watching and then goof off when you're bossing around? Or do you work diligently and faithfully whether anyone's watching or not? The simple litmus test for that is what would you choose not to do if your mother was standing beside you watching you? If you wouldn't do it with mom watching over your shoulder, you probably shouldn't be doing it at all. And yet so often, since God is not a God who judges us by sending down a lightning bolt, we think we're getting away with something. There are people who who believe that if it's laying there, I can take it, it's mine. Like these guys at Christmas time who were going around stealing packages off people's front doorsteps. 
How horrible. And yet some people justify that I don't have as much as somebody else, so I can take it. You see, in thought, word, and deed, we are sinful. Wesley understood that. He never said we could be perfect without sin, but he did say we could grow and mature in such a way as to love God and love others just like Jesus. So how is God going to do that? How is God, how does he desire to mold and shape you into the image of his son? We're going to be talking about that for the next three weeks, but it starts today with this understanding that you truly grow in your appreciation of what Jesus has done for you. What God wants you to understand is that he loves you in spite of your sin. Because not one of us is perfect, and yet he looks upon us as his children and he loves us unequivocally. There's nothing he desires more than to celebrate you as his child. And he wants what is good for you. That's why he wants to mold and shape you to become everything that is in his heart for you to be. And as you grow in that understanding, as you understand what Jesus did, that he truly took your sins and suffered for them, God begins to work in your life, sifting out the dross, sifting out the impurities. Because all of a sudden, Sin doesn't hold the same excitement that it used to. And we used to run headlong into sin and celebrate it. And now we begin to have disdain for our sinfulness. We begin to realize that it saddens the heart of God and it starts to sadden our heart when we, when we sin. We may still be trapped in sins and struggling, but we don't desire that anymore. We don't celebrate that anymore. We want to be different. When that desire begins to happen in your heart that you want to be different, that's the refining fire of God working in you. Not fires of judgment, but fires of life. Purifying you, making you like Jesus. And your actions then begin to change, and your, your words begin to change, and your thoughts begin to change. All of a sudden, instead of thinking how horrible I am, if that's the way you go, you begin to realize how precious you are to God, and that begins to guide your life. Or if you've gone the other way, and you judge other people so quickly, you begin to realize that your desire is to love them and to bless them, regardless of who they are or regardless of what they've done. Because God has called you to be a blessing to them. Your words begin to change. The apostles have told us, anyone who does not bridle their tongue is deceiving themselves. We begin to change the way we speak. And we speak only what blesses another, what edifies them and builds them up. And we do not use our words to tear others down. And our actions change. Again, to a litmus test. Is what I'm about to do going to bring glory to God and bless my neighbor? Then I will do it. If it does not, then it is not what God wants me to do. You see, as you grow and deepen in your understanding of how much God loves you and the sacrifice Jesus made for you, it begins to work and change your heart. And that is the refining fire of God's love, molding you and shaping you to become the image of Jesus in the world. And at that point, as we grow, we can be different than we were yesterday. We can mature. And we can accomplish what Jesus entrusted to us. Love God and love our neighbor more than ourselves, because that's exactly what Jesus did. That is his heart. Because he loved his father and he loved you more than he loved himself. Because he went to the cross because the father's heart was breaking because he did not have his children. And he went to the cross because you were lost and could not find your way home. He went to the cross because he loved his father and because he loved you more than he loved himself. And when you understand that, then God is changing you. 
He's molding you and shaping you into the reflection of Jesus in the world. And as we live as the reflection of Jesus, then God is able to use us to accomplish His heart's desire. And what is the desire of God's heart? To establish His kingdom in this world in every single heart. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and a life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.